Hello, and welcome to my guide on creating a 2D sprite distortion. For those who only want to see how the nodes are set up, here's a small scroll preview of how the shader will be done. This shader will not work until a custom render feature is created for the Universal Pipeline Renderer. If you are still around, then I'll assume that you'd like to see a more in-depth tutorial on how to create such a graph. You can use the timestamps down below in the description to find what portion of the video you actually need. First off, our project needs to be set up using either URP or HDRP. I'll be using the Universal Render Pipeline, which I show how to set up in my Lava Shader video, which is linked in the description below. This particular shader can be completed using any of the shader graphs. However, I'll be using the 2D Sprite Unlit Experimental Graph. I will associate a material to the shader. So now it's time to open up the graph and get started on the good stuff. I know that I want this shader to involve movement. The easiest method to accomplish this is using a time node combined with a tiling and offset node. I will start off by creating a time node, which I'll be utilizing the first output called time. This is a constantly increasing value, which is perfect for a persistent movement. To employ the time node to the fullest extent, we will multiply the value by a vector two. This vector two will help us control the horizontal and vertical movement speed of our UV. We need to connect the output of our multiply and plug it into the offset input of a tiling and offset node. It is good practice to group nodes together that are accomplishing a certain task, which for this group of nodes is controlling the UV movement. I would recommend understanding what this was doing since this is a very common technique used by shaders, which I explained more in depth in my lava shader video. We now have movement but we can't do anything until we have a texture to manipulate. You can utilize a bump map texture by using a texture 2D that is sampled, but for our example, I'll be using a gradient noise. Create a gradient noise node, plug the output of the tiling and offset node into the UV input of the gradient noise. You should now notice the preview of the gradient noise is moving. I wanna be able to easily adjust the gradient noise scale, so let's create a vector one and call it gradient noise scale. Plug this property into the gradient noise scale input, and this is all we need for the shape generation. We now have a moving UV, so what can we do to make it a distortion effect? We need to manipulate our image, which if you are dealing with shaders, understanding the difference between the vertex shader and the fragment shader is important. A simple explanation is the vertex shader allows the manipulation of the vertices for position, color, and lighting. The fragment shader is typically considered the controlling of color of the individual pixels on the screen based on the vertex shader information. When you think of distortion, you might initially think the vertex shader. However, we'll be utilizing the fragment shader to achieve our goal. The problem we are tackling here is we wanna get what is being shown on screen and manipulate what is being shown. Then combine the original scene with the altered information. The million dollar question is how to achieve this. Well, let me show you. Shadergraph has taken into account that users may want to get the current fragment screen position. And good news for us, there is a simple node called screen position that delivers just this. Create a screen position node. You'll notice it looks like a typical UV node. You can think of this as the current screen view is converted into a quad, which is just geometry that consists of two triangles and is the shape of the camera view, and the image from the scene is being mapped onto this geometry. Knowing we can grab the current scene view, we now need to do something to get our effect. In this case, we will multiply the output of our screen position with the output of our gradient noise. The preview will reveal that the UV is being altered by our gradient noise. A big thing to note here is the color of the UV is not moving. This means the screen position info is not moving either. The screen position can be altered though, using the remap node, uh, but this is going a little outside of our scope for this example. I would like to control the distortion strength, which I will create a vector two called distortion power with the X and Y both being set to one. I'll take the output of our multiply and multiply this against the distortion power. This gives a noise infused screen position image to work with. We need to add this back into our original screen position. This ultimately gives the effect that the scene view is being distorted. This sounds like it should do the trick, but there is one last little step that is important. We need to access the current camera's color buffer, which is essentially the stored scene before it gets rendered to the screen. 
we will create a scene color node, which does exactly what we need. Plug our add output to the scene colors node input. Finally, we plug the output of our scene color node into the color input of our master node. Once the shader graph is saved, we can now use the shader for 3D. If you are having issues with this working, you'll need to click on your render pipeline asset and check mark depth texture and opaque texture. Checking off these options are important for 2D as well, so it's a good idea to keep this step no matter what. If you are still around, I assume you want to use this technique for 2D sprites, Duh. which means we need to delve into custom render features. This may sound scary, but let's walk through it together and get a better understanding of it. Locate your forward render asset. Have you ever wondered what this asset even does? Simply put, it is the loop of how Unity renders the screen, which typically is culling rendered objects from the scene, building data for the renderer, then outputting an image to the frame buffer. I know I use some fancy terms, but calling just means dismissing any geometry that can't be seen by the camera. Building data for the renderer is just the process of collecting all pertinent information, such as calling data, quality settings, and the current platform the program is running on. And as for the frame buffer, that is just the location the final image is being stored to be displayed on screen. The best part about the forward renderer is there is a step right before this final execution of the image called the setup renderer. This controls the render passes, which a very generic definition would be a scene is rendered by creating multiple images that are layered on top of each other, then combined to get a final image output. This setup step is exactly where the custom renderer features come into play. Now we have a bit of understanding of what's going on, so it's time to create the feature. With the forward render asset selected, look in the inspector and click the button that says add render feature and select the render objects experimental option. The name field can be filled out with any name, so I'll just call mine distortion feature. The event is actually very important for us since 2D sprites are considered transparent. So we need to select before rendering transparency. This event is just dictating when to execute the render passes for that frame. We now need to add a filter. This is going to give us more control over which objects are being rendered. The Q option needs to be changed to transparent. This Q option is telling a renderer to work only with the selected type of objects. So for us, any object considered transparent is going to be affected here. Before we mess with the layer mask, we need to create a new layer for our object that will be using the distortion shader. Create a new layer, which I'll be calling distortion effect. This name doesn't matter, but a name that makes sense is preferred. Now we have our object with the distortion effect layer added, we can go back to our custom render feature. We need to change the layer mask settings. This filter option is saying that any layer mask option that is checked will be rendered before anything else. So initially select everything, then uncheck our distortion effect. The idea behind this is we want all the transparent objects to render, which would be our 2D sprites, and then render our distortion object over top of these items. With this last step completed, you can now use the distortion effect on 2D sprites. I have two of the same sprites in the scene. One is left alone while the other has our distortion material applied to it. It is important to note that any sprite you want affected by the distortion effect must be on an order layer that is less than or equal to the distortion effect object. You should notice that the sprite that has the distortion effect is completely transparent. So you can use any sprite object you want and the effect should still work. Now we have a scene set up and everything applied. The very last step is using the inspector of our distort material and tweaking the speed, power, and noise scale to get the look we want. I know there was a lot of technical information in this video, but I hope I stepped through it in a manner that allowed you to understand and absorb the information. There were a few concepts that I had to give a very basic higher level look at. So to supplement what I missed there, uh, there are links in the description for that. Also, if you are confused on the shader graph nodes, you can right click on any of them and select open documentation to get the Unity documentation. I hope you learned from and enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider subscribing. But with that being said, I hope you take care and be safe.